we had a group when I was in college studying philosophy. There was a group of friends that would get together, and we would talk about politics at a craft beer bar, and we called ourselves the Enlightened Imbibers. And that was the original name of the brewery, but imbiber is sort of a confusing word for some people, including state regulators who <laughs> couldn't pronounce it. The Enlightened Imbiber. What is that word, Imbiber? What is that Imbibers. word? Imbibers. Well. So we just changed it to Enlightened Brewing Company. Didn't he it just cancel his tour, Justin Imbiber? Yeah, let's not go off the rails here, Jim. Uh, and Back this is so rails, getting cut. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Cheers. Tap takeover. Tap takeover. Tap takeover. Welcome back to the Tap Takeover Podcast Brewery Series, powered by Shepherd Express. I'm Jesus. I'm joined with Jim and Andy. Today we are at Enlightened Brewing Company in Bayview. We will be joined by Tommy Vanderbord and James Larson. Enlightened Brewing Company started in 2013 in the building next door. If you want to check out that space, it's the current home of Eagle Park Brewing, friends of the show. They expanded and moved into this new location, both locations in Bayview. We'll find out more how much they love Bayview and so much more. We'll also touch on their early days, what they're up to now, and what they got going on for the rest of the year. First, thank you for taking time to meet with us. Before we get started, would you mind introducing yourself and just tell us your go-to beer from your list? Ooh, from our list? Yeah. So I'm Tommy. Vandervoort, I'm co-owner of Enlightened Brewing Company. I would say the one I come back to the most is probably a priori pale ale. Nice. But I do bounce around a lot, especially when we have new stuff on. That's a great Emmanuel Kant reference, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, it's really confusing. I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy, and I won't pretend to understand all the jargon. <laughs> Uh, and I'm James Larson, uh, also co-owner, and I am a Cream City Bricks man. It's nice work sure beer, are. hot time, hot summertime beer. That's what I like. Excellent. Well, as we like to do in the podcast, we are doing a tasting now, and I think we'll just go around the horn and see what we're having and uh, hear what you guys feel like we should be tasting right now. I'm having the Lake Conic, and I guess what uh, style and what, uh, what flavor profiles here? Uh, Laconic is uh, what we're calling an IBA, an India Brown Ale. That's sort of a dogfish head sort of stolen style, if you will. We we made a, a, a really hoppy beer with honey that's a little bit darker than an IPA, so we kind of just made it up. Um, we used Citra and something else. I can't remember, but Was a lot of honey. Was it Citra and Mandarina or Citra? Yeah, it might have been. Vitamin. Yeah, so some like fruity, juicy hops, but with good dose of caramel malt and the honey. I remember when I first tried it, even as a home brewer, I've had a hard time like getting br- that color brown because you can use any range of dark malts <laughs> in different proportions to try to get that color. But what I like about what's in the Laconic is that you can taste like a little bit of caramely sweetness and just like subtle toast flavors, but you get a lot of the fruitier, bitter pine, you know, Happy uh, notes as well. See, that's a lot better than me just saying it's good. <laughs> <laughs> more, way so more they're both here. accurate statements, though. <laughs> yeah. Andy, accurate. Andy or Jim, what do you guys? Yeah, so I've got the Newton's Constant. It's a little lower gravity than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you add in the <laughs> wah, wah, yeah. wah. I, oh, It took me a minute to register that, that joke. <laughs> sorry. A late on the laugh. Yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about this. This is a um, straight stout, correct? Yeah, straight stout, not not super sweet, not very strong, but with a good, bold flavor. I'd say it's got a nice body to it. You'll get a little bit of creaminess. I won't speak to the ingredients, but I think there's oats in there. Yeah, it's oats, midnight wheat, uh, base malt, and caramel 60. Caramel 60. So it's basically the same beer recipe for our winter seasonal sustained thought with a few exceptions and then just without coffee from Valentine Coffee. So cool. it's our off-season stout. Oh, I bet you this has got to be delicious with the coffee then. It's good with <laughs> coffee. Yeah. yeah there's, a, sure. there's a few other tweaks, but you know, there <laughs> it was we'll a fun that one. For another that was a good podcast. one to name. We like went around the horn around the horn a lot on we just were riffing on like black holes and gravity and then we got into like physics discussions about big g versus little g <laughs> and mass and acceleration and all it's, it's just super nerdy. Pretty nerdy yeah you guys gotta be really fun at parties <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Well, we, these, only because we only get invited to parties nowadays because we make beer. So. <laughs> it helps. It You're definitely like, oh, helps. Not these guys again. <laughs> so I'm drinking uh, From the Roots, which you guys recently released for your first anniversary in this space, correct? And you guys did something mm-hmm. interesting where you used uh, maple sap and, instead of water, right? Yes. Can you tell us, our listeners, a little bit about this strong ale here? So this is the second iteration of this beer. We actually made it upstairs. Um, much smaller system, but same idea. Yeah, so the first one, a friend of mine stopped by the warehouse, and he was going to try and ferment and then distill at the distillery next door, Twisted Path Distillery, the maple sap that he had collected to make maple syrup with. But the maple sap has such a low gravity that you can't ferment it, really. It's probably the same gravity as a finished beer. And so Tommy and I probably had the same idea at the same time where we said, well, why don't we just use it instead of water? Yeah, it looks like water. Happens. It kind of acts like water. It, you taste it, and it's not very sweet, but it does right. have just such a subtle amount of... You can barely detect it. Yeah. Th- that was your first foray into bottling, too, wasn't it? Yeah. The second time we did it was this time around. We collected a, a lot more maple sap. We filled two fermenters with maple sap, and then when we were ready to brew transferred it over to the hot liquor tank we tried to stay within the same sort of vein as the original one which was sort of this interesting dark ale and so i looked at the old recipe and tried to use what we had for this time around and you know this is what we got and so it's on tap for now until it's gone yeah we sold out of all the bottles so So we had that release day for uh, corresponding with our one-year anniversary (laughs) of opening the tap room we were honestly we were pretty surprised and blown away by the response that the fact that we were able to move through all those bottles in like three hours it was just incredible i was here it's like people were coming in buying full cases of it. it was yeah. wild and we didn't put a limit on it so we we wanted to get it in people's hands so we didn't say you can only buy one bottle just come in and get as much as you want so That's and what are you gentlemen enjoying this evening actually both of us drinking cream city bricks right <laughs> <That's> now <right. laughs> the go-to yeah. the go-to cream city it's probably the beer we moved through the most of. Um, light-bodied cream ale, easy drinking, the style that's been around since before Prohibition. Sort of the the German ale. Um, yeah, so it's the the version the ale version of their premium quality lager. So in the winter time or in the summertime when they didn't have the right temperatures or they couldn't get ice to lager their beer, they turned to ale recipes to turn their beer over in a similar fashion and faster i suppose so excellent great so uh, let's get a little history on you guys so you both started out as home brewers for each of you what really was the genesis that got you started brewing you know i was a bartender for a long time in the service industry and i that's how i got to know a lot of different kinds of beers basically i got a homebrew kit for christmas and the rest is history i fell in love with the process of brewing and I just thought it was really cool that it was it was really cool to drink a beer that was like known as a world class beer and and also know something about the process of making it. The fact that you could appreciate that somebody actually made this beer. I don't know. It's, it was there was such a disconnect for me for a long time between drinking a beer and how it was made. But once I got to know that process and realized that somebody does that for a living, that's what I wanted to do for a living. So I started making a lot of different kinds of beer and sharing it with my bartender friends and found a way to turn it into a business, you know, do it for a living. That was always the goal. Yeah, I suppose mine's a a similar story. I I started drinking, you know, younger age, I suppose. Uh, 21, right? Yeah, 21, of course. (laughs) Right on the day, 21, definitely 21. (laughs) You know, I was sitting around drinking with, you know, some friends, and I was drinking Spotted Cow or something like that, and they were all drinking PBR and, you know, Old Milwaukee and all these things, and I didn't really enjoy them. I didn't think that they tasted very good. And, you know, I, I have found an appreciation for them now. I, they're not bad beers. I enjoy those beers on occasion. But I kind of recognized that there was more to beer than meets the eye. There's more to beer than commodity brand beer. And I said, somebody does this for a living. How do I do this for a living. So I went to, you know, I I was in college at the time and I started with um, microbiology and organic chemistry. Couldn't hack that, didn't understand it. It was all too weird for me. So I dropped out of that. And then I went to mechanical engineering. That wasn't working. So I dropped out of that and asked my dad what to do. And he said, why don't you get a marketing degree? Uh, (laughs) So I did that and tried to get a job in a brewery. And they said, do you want to run our Facebook? That sounds cool, right? I'm like, no. 
So I actually went back to school and got a master's degree in brewing and distilling in order to get a job as a, as a brewer at Bell's Brewing Company. So I had to get another degree in order to get a job, okay. and I loved it. So I did that and then met Tommy and came on here. Yeah, So, but your degree is not from a local university, is it? No, it's not from a local university. I went to uh, Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland. How did you end up there? Well, I knew that I wanted to get a master's degree. I didn't want a certificate or, you know, some other form of degree, a diploma or something like that. I wanted to make sure that, you know, it was worth the time and energy that it was. I looked around and I applied to UC Davis, uh, where there's a number of different degrees, but they do um, a, a master brewers program, which I found out wasn't a master's degree. It was just a, you know, it was similar to... A diploma or something like that, a little more intensive, and it was definitely a great program, but I couldn't actually get in because I didn't have an engineering or a biological sciences background. Sure enough, Harriet Watt was looking for business students because they were launching a business in the food and beverage industries program within the brewing and distilling program, and so they, they let me in and they, they let me have some fun with them. And thankfully, I passed everything. I'm, I'm still surprised at that. So are there, are there any beers from, from the early days when you guys first started? that are still part of your lineup today? I think the ones that have been around the longest, Prototypical Porter, that was the first beer that we ever released to the public, I guess, started selling professionally. Legally. Legally. (laughs) (laughs) That has maintained its character from the upstairs brewery that we had down here. Cream City Bricks is a new one. Kettle Logic Amber is a new one. A Priori Pale Ale has been around for a while, but has gone through a lot of different iterations. It took us some time to dial in exactly the character that we wanted and that was just like hop additions yeah you know, we, we started grains i think you designed the, the first recipe for it and i changed a few things right off the bat i said that's let's let's do this let's do that and then what we got was more of a pale ale we were trying to do a, a hoppy amber sort of thing and then from there we just kept making small changes small changes and then we decided Small changes weren't cutting it, so we did one bigger, big overhaul, and and that was it. Now we're now we're with that same recipe. So yeah, I would say a lot of the beers we just came from us deciding to make some kind of example of a style that we were interested in at the time. A lot of it depended on what raw materials we had, so we would look at the grain bills and say, oh, it "Looks like we could probably make this kind of beer," um, but we never really set out to have. We never made a beer and said, this is our flagship, whatever, you name it. Uh, It was more organic than that. So that's why a lot of the beers are new, haven't been around for a while. It took some time for us to figure it out. So there was never a aha moment that uh, you produced a a batch and went, I could really do this. People would love to have this in their mouths. Gosh, as a home (laughs) brewer. (laughs) Yes, as a home brewer. I see what you did there, Jim. I like it. As a home brewer. as a home brewer, I think the first beer I made was an aha moment. It was like, wow, this wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. And it tastes like beer. And it's getting me uh, that happy feeling like beer, you know. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, a couple more later and you're like, yep, yeah, let's do this. I'm starting a brewery tomorrow. It's no big deal. I've completely disowned all my home brewer recipes. And that is a function <laughs> of how just stupid elaborate the recipes that I had as a home brewer where it was like I mean I would use I mean, but like at home a dozen you can do grains that. yeah, yeah. I mean, do it you can buy like five pounds of this five pounds of that whatever yeah. and then hop additions you can play around with, you know just using an ounce at a time or something like that so 20% none of, those really of my grist bill will actually be hops <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice yeah yeah we don't do, do that. whatever you want <laughs> yeah it's it's a little more keep it simple on you know as you get to scale so from those early days, now you want a brewery. So what can you tell us a little bit about those growing pains and tell us about the small space you were in before? I think we made it hard on ourselves on a, in a lot of ways because we did start so small, but it was sort of the only way that we could get going without accumulating a ton of debt or, you know, I don't, we, don't, we don't have rich uncles or anything like that that could get us going on a big system. So it was basically take our homebrew system and get it licensed, find a commercial space, and figure out how we can make some beer that at least we could get out to the neighborhood. So that's where it all started was put the homebrew in a warehouse space in in our neighborhood in Bayview. So that second floor brewery that we had was just 500 square feet. We were doing 15 gallons at a time. We had a 15, I guess a half barrel brew house with one barrel fermentation tanks and a three barrel bright tank. 
It was a nightmare. Yeah, it was. It was really a nightmare. But but it's hard to get volume on, on that kind of system. Well, I mean, it, not only that, it was it was six, it was six times around to brew, to fill one bright tank, and if we if we left any space in that bright tank, we were not at our maximum capacity. We weren't doing our jobs right. So that means we had to brew twice a day, three days a week in a row to fill three one barrel fermenters to then fill a bright tank. We had to turn that around every single week every single time we possibly could and now we're sitting down here and what we had what we did in a month in our old brewery we can do more than that in a week here and that's not a that's not an insane jump normally when people go from that small to larger they can do 10 times or 20 times what they were doing in uh in a month in a day but we wanted to make sure that we're we're taking the steps to go nice and slow, nice and easy, and that might be another growing pain. Is that you know we're already running out of room in in this space. We need to find another space after this one. Who knows where that's going to come from? Who knows where we're going to be able to do that? So the yeah, old space been, was was fun. It was small. It was it got easy. us going. It was home. Yeah, we have now. This is home. Fond so. memories of that place. Um, <laughs> Like it's that far away. It's just right upstairs. <laughs> yeah, it's literally, we could go up there oh, right that, now. That's so Wonderland. Yeah. Do you ever visit Eagle Park and go? How do you guys do this? It's funny. They uh, they've taken it and made it their own, and they kind of operate a different way. Uh, they they kind of jammed it with um, one barrel tanks, so they're using the same production space, basically on the same size brewery. I think they may have just got a one barrel. I think they're doing a one and a half barrel, but. You'll have to ask them about that. Right. <laughs> it's, it is kind of fun to see how they're running that space up there after we moved out. So, gentlemen, let's talk about location. We've heard you express your love for Bayview several times. Well, so why Bayview? We all live in Bayview. <laughs> <laughs> like well, we all live in Bayview now. Tommy, when Tommy started, he lived in Bayview. That was a local spot. Where at? In here. You when I was down here, yeah. Oh, Maybe. when I was home brewing? Yeah. 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 I, was, I lived right across the street from Sugar Maple, and that's where it all started in the basement so really the first brewery was a, a place you were you rented because the like a lot of the paperwork still has that address on it which is a house yeah it's funny um which i don't think you can legally do i don't know how you got away with that but yeah, so you got uh <laughs> federal permits for the basement of your house no we, <laughs> yeah. you know it was sort of like the first steps of incorporating a business or like trying to take it legit was you have to have like an office address kind of thing so obviously that was my house and it took us some time before all the paperwork was transitioned into like where the brewery actually was instead of that house <laughs> that I was living in. I think we still get some we still get some stuff from Brees sent to that location. Nobody nobody <laughs> yeah, do you know anybody sending, that lives there now? Yeah, they're sending yeah, my okay. old roommates just bills of lading of or whatever. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry guys. As long as it's as long as they're out. forking over those malted milk balls, I'm fine with it. <laughs> But Bayview, we love the we love the neighborhood because there's just a bunch of like-minded people who are deep thinkers and enjoy good food and beverage, and there's a lot of family. It's just a nice eclectic mix of city and suburb, I guess. There's a lot to do. That helps a lot. Like plenty of green space and parks that you can go to, but great bars and restaurants. It's close to the lake. It's just a wonderful neighborhood to be in wonderful community to be in yeah people we get the sense that people care about each other and we're always willing to kind of lend a hand we try to support neighborhood causes as much as we can so it's a good sense of community that's important so just kind of circling back to your original location and the size of the batches and the limited kind of amounts of beer you're producing the cash flow must have been kind of tight how did you guys kind of survive day to day and uh, also look to fund the expansion. I remember close fist fights, almost almost <laughs> fist fights over cash flow. Yeah, uh, because we didn't have a tap room, so it's not like we had money coming in every week or something like that where it was predictable. It was we were just hovering by the to, mailbox waiting for a check to show up to yeah, and it, pay for some more malt for or some yeast. At or least something. the first year that we were in here, it was. I was still uh, bartending, and so it just was personal income that was paying the rent. But in order to do the brewery full-time, I had to quit being a bartender because of Tidehouse laws. You can't work on the retail tier of alcohol and on the production tier or the wholesaler tier, you know, any combination thereof. 
once I lost that source of income, it was like really critical to get out and start selling beer to bars and restaurants, but there was no space for a tap room, even if we wanted it up there. Eagle Park rented the space next to them, and that's where their tap room is now, but at, at the time we were up there, that was occupied by somebody. So it was, yeah, it was hard scrabble, and I don't, we've always been kind of a scrappy, bootstrap style brewery. I lived, I lived with my parents. I quit, I quit a job at another brewery because I couldn't couldn't keep up with the amount of work that we had to do to keep turning beer out and keep getting stuff on the on the truck or in the back of my car to get to a bar and restaurant so i moved in with my parents and said all right i don't have any income let me just let me just do this as much as i possibly can like we need to we need to get moving on this so and we've done a lot of things ourselves too like especially with this build out down here installing the trench drain and you guys installing the tanks and we built the walk-in cooler that we have and it was just as much as we could do on our own. That's what we did. We definitely didn't have like a silver spoon. We were undercapitalized, you might say. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely undercapitalized. But we were also pretty lucky to have friends and, and family that really like to do this sort of stuff sure. where they want to help out. Help. Yeah, so I mean, I would. We were down here in this space. You know, it's same sort of stories are true for the old space and we're sitting down here with a keg of beer in the middle of a a nothing space painting the walls listening to music on a little bose mini sound cube thing (laughs) you know trying to order pizzas for everybody saying thanks so much (laughs) let's we got to get this done today so we can paint the floor and you know yada 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 all the same stories that everybody has but you know we've been we've been lucky in that respect so running a brewery is a lot of hard work you just mentioned that you get a lot of help from family and friends but how many hours a week do you typically spend in here? Oh, boy. Depends on the week. Yeah, it does depend on the week. It really does vary. I would say at least I try to take one one day of rest on Sundays, although the tap room's open on Sundays now, so somebody's here still. You know, it's, it's not so much a clock in, clock out kind of thing. There's always something to do. More of a lifestyle, I guess. You're, you're constantly working or not working. It's the sound of a salesman right there. I get in at <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning. No, I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm here at 5 a.m. Yeah. I got the... I leave it. I make a pot of coffee. I chug it as fast as I can. No. It, I mean, it really does depend. It's That's the beauty of being your own boss is you get to work half days every day. It's just which 12 hours do you want to work. <laughs> right. Thanks, Lou, that's, for that one. Thanks, that's Lou. Great. <laughs> Shout out to Lou. I think it's a good time to take a little break, get some more beer. Let's go to some beer news with Andy, and when we come back... We'll hear about this guy's uh, cellar collection, maybe some upcoming beer releases, and just what other events they got coming up here at Enlightened Brewing Company. We'll be right back. That's right. Welcome back to this episode's edition of Beer News, recorded on 11 7 of 2017. The rumors have been confirmed, folks. Founders is bringing back CBS Canadian Breakfast Stout starting December 1st at the brewery. Tickets go on sale November 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through the link found on the Founders website. If you don't get tickets or you do not feel like traveling to Michigan, don't worry folks. CBS, which hasn't been bottled since 2011, will be hitting distro in all 48 states that Founders distributes in. But you better make sure that you keep an eye on your social media sites for all your favorite beer stops because this one is going to go extremely fast depending on how big they go in their distro. Let's hope it's big as the annual KBS run. This time of year marks the annual release of Perennials Abraxas. This pepper stout hits Midwest distribution within the next two weeks. It was released at the brewery in St. Louis last weekend, and Alex from the Tap Takeover podcast actually attended the event. Oh, it was a fantastic event. The line went really smoothly. Got into line and to the door, I would say, within 20 minutes. You know, that's how quickly the line worked uh, for the regular Braxis. The pre-sale for the uh, the four packs um, also went really smoothly. I was in the four o'clock group, but uh, I got served at noon, you know, so there was no, really no waiting around. The two new variants are fantastic. The the vanilla Braxis is incredibly smooth. That, that's already trading really highly on the, the secondary market. Although I would say the, the Sump Coffee of Brax 
Axis was by far my favorite and uh, the favorite of a, a few uh, employees at the brewery as well. Most stores that get this in the Milwaukee area will only see a one case distribution of the Abraxas. You will not see the variants anywhere in the city except on tap at Bernhardt's on Saturday, November 25th. Time tappings of the coffee and vanilla have yet to be announced, but this is one you're not going to want to miss, folks. Start planning now for Lakefront's annual Black Friday release on November 24th at 8 a.m. We suggest getting there earlier this year as a one-bottle limit of very special edition Black Friday will be available to the first thousand people. This triple X named Black Friday is a blend of the previous three years of Black Friday. Not only can you get three bottles of the regular Black Friday, which was aged in rye whiskey barrels this year for the first time ever. This event is always a blast and a must attend for the TTP crew every year. So we, we will see you in line super early and maybe we'll share a beer together. If interested, make sure you email us at taptakeoverpodcast at gmail.com and maybe we can arrange a bottle share. Also on Black Friday, after you picked up your allotment at Lakefront, make sure you're checking your local stores for info about the upcoming Goose Island Bourbon County release. This release is a hit every single year, and everything that hits the stores sells very quickly, so you're going to want to have a line on this one. On Saturday, on Saturday, December 16th, Good City releases their second edition of Density at 10 a.m. This barrel-aged double stout was a big hit last year in the area, and we're sure it won't disappoint this year, too. They will also be releasing 16-ounce cans of Dr. J IPA. And this has been Beer News. Thank you again, Andy, for another very informative edition of Beer News Extra Extra. Before we get back to our interview with uh, Tommy and James, let's talk about the beer we're sampling now. So I've got the A Priori uh, Pale Ale. Tell us what I should be tasting. So A Priori is our year-round pale ale. It's made with Pacific Northwest American hops, but has a nice multi backbone. So the idea behind this beer was definitely balance. We didn't want a super dry, super hoppy, bitter bomb. We wanted to put it in balance. Yeah, it's like a Anglo-American pale ale is a, a funnier way to put it, I, I think. <laughs> yeah. But it's got Columbus, Cascade, and Centennial, and it's super simple grain bill. So it's just base malt, carapils, and caramel 60. Awesome. And I have your uh, pale wheat, the daily stipend. Yep, pale wheat's the summer seasonal, spring-summer seasonal for us. The daily stipend, a beer that... You know, if you could get one beer after a shift every day, we pick this one. It's made with red wheat, but also nice and bitter. It's not super creamy and sweet. Mandarina Bavaria is the hop that's in it, so a single hop with that. So, so you could bring back the old Paps, you know, beer break, right? With the daily stipend. The beer break, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's called the daily stipend because our now head brewer, who came on as, as an intern originally and kind of morphed through the, I don't know, the stations of the, the brewery, yeah. if you will. No, no, not to make it all weird and, and religious <laughs> or anything like that, but he would bring 12-ounce medicine bottle as a growler because we would be sampling beers all day. We'd have a couple beers at the end of the day in the old brewery. We'd hang out. We'd talk about it. We'd clean up. It'd be great. And then he was like, well, I don't want to I don't want to drink too much more when I get home because then I'm hungover and I don't want to come into work, but I definitely want some more beer when i get home so he would take one beer home and you know we kind of named this beer for his weird 12 ounce growler it was mike's daily stipend daily stipend (laughs) awesome and uh, i have the kettle logic amber so tell us about that one kettle logic was the first amber that we ever tried to make even i don't know if i should say it or not (laughs) Say say it we wanted to make we wanted to make an amber that didn't suck we had a lot of ambers out there. That, Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, not to knock other people's beer or whatever, but it wasn't a style a that we preference. particularly enjoyed. We just hadn't had that much success. There are amazing ambers out there. We definitely love them, but it's one of those ones where it was harder for us to sink in to that style. So actually, I still have the original recipe in my notebook because Tommy came to me and said, "Hey, dude, can you make an amber that doesn't suck?" So I wrote <laughs> down in my my notebook. Amber that doesn't suck. Thankfully, we got a better name with Kettle Logic. <laughs> yeah, so a lighter beer. It's not a, a big malt bomb. It's not super biscuity. It does have that nice amber color without a lot of the extra oomph that 
you get out of some ambers on the market. Well, speaking of the beer names, you already explained Daily Stipend, but you have some unique beer names. How did you come up with those? So a lot of them are meant to provoke conversation or make you look something up on Wikipedia. They come from philosophy or science or just try to like add a little bit of research into the experience. So a priori pale ale that comes from Immanuel Kant and that's describes it's part of his theory of knowledge if you know something a priori or if something is true you have a priori knowledge it's true by definition so uh true prior true (laughs) right because there's post priori well there's posteriori priori a priori and a posteriori i can feel so many people hitting the stop button i know (laughs) delete (laughs) i'm just getting schooled here by a philosophy major though it's just jargon uh but Basically, it's Kant's theory of knowledge. So there's a ton you can look up on the internet. Kettle logic is the same thing. It's a type of logic that's used in philosophical argument. Newton's constant, obviously, it talks about the equation of gravity. And so we just try to like load up our beer names with more information than this. But they just don't all the need to be philosophical or educational. I mean, they can right. be pun and awfulness fully intended here, laconic as laconic. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, so it's just short and sweet, blunt, brutal names. It's getting harder and harder to name beers because there are just thousands of breweries out there now. And I think we have a good beer name. We search for it on Google and we find out that, you know, some brewery in North Carolina has already done it or, or a brewery in Europe. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of hair tugging. There's a lot of beard tugging as well, yeah. trying to figure out what what we can actually call a, a beer or what we have to kind of think about. Well, it's a oatmeal company in you know, Texas that's really small. Do you think we can get away with it still? Uh, I don't know. I don't Is think so. Uh, Hall and Oats? Oats? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we made and they, oat- got, they got sued by the band anyway, so we're lucky we right. didn't go with it. Yeah, it's so. a good thing. It was like an oat pale ale that we wanted to call Hall and Oats. Ooh. Like hauling oats. Punny. Really punny, punny stuff. Because Hall and Oats is my favorite band. I think we can all agree when Rene Descartes, a drunken fart, said, I drink, therefore I am. Nice. Very nice. That's true. <laughs> that is true. The beer name trying to make people think. Is that why your brewery name is Enlightened? Or where did it come from? Yeah, it kind of harkens to that spirit of getting together and having conversation. The common thing being beer. Good beer. Beer that's you know, well-crafted and made by somebody that's in your neighborhood. That's a a dimension of it, but we had a group when I was in college studying philosophy. There was a group of friends that would get together, and we would talk about politics and all kinds of, like, loaded topics at a craft beer bar, always around good beer. That was the one thing that we'd always agree on was, you know, enjoyable, like, well-crafted beer. And we called ourselves the Enlightened Imbibers, and that was the original name of the brewery, but imbiber is sort of a confusing word for some people, including state regulators, who <laughs> couldn't pronounce it. The enlightened imbiber. What is that word, imbiber? What is that Imbiber. Yeah. So we just changed it to Enlightened Brewing Company. But Didn't he just cancel inspire. his tour, Justin Imbiber? He did, I heard. It's so, so, terrible. Yeah. He was a, oh, God. God. He was a Let's not go books. off the rails here, Jim. <laughs> One of the big questions we ask every brewer, since we are the Tap Takeover podcast, if you were to take over the taps for, for the Tap Takeover podcast, what, you know, four or five beers would tell the story of Enlightened Brewery. Our beers or any beers? Your beers. Our beers. A priori, Kettle Logic, Cream City Bricks, and Prototypical Porter. (laughs) (laughs) There's the story. Wow. Mic drop. Yeah. Uh, Is there a reason you picked those? Is that just There are four year-round beers. I think that you get a glimpse into us as brewers and us as a company. I mean, not necessarily the full, you know, story, but you can kind of get everything. We've got something hoppy. We've got something... Uh, delicate and easy to drink. We've got something a little bit more sessionable, and we've got something dark. I think that covers most of the bases, for me, anyway. Yeah, um, and there's also a common thread there, which is not super high ABV beers. I mean, each of those are very different beers, different styles, but the common thread is that you could have one or two without being completely hammered. What are the beers that got you guys into craft beer, then? I started drinking Kr- uh, Grolsch. When I was Grolsch. young, yeah, Grolsch was, nice. was my first beer. Was a Grolsch in the UK <laughs> with some family. First ever beer. First ever beer was Grolsch, and I was like, "That's pretty good. I like that." <laughs> and then I think first craft beer was obviously Spotted Cow, being from Wisconsin. So I think everybody's raised on Spotted Cow in here, or here in Wisconsin. I have a Belgian beer background. From I worked for Lowlands Group for many years. Their theme was, you know, Belgian beers. 
including like Belgian style beers made by Goose Island and some other American brewers. I'll never forget the first beer that completely blew my mind was a Rodenbach Grand Cru sour beer. I never, I didn't know sour beers existed. I just started working there. I had just turned 21 and I just picked a bottle. I mean, it's like, I would like to try one that I haven't had. So I pointed at one and I said that one and it was a Rodenbach Grand Cru and it, it sent me down the rabbit hole of like, how on earth do you create a beer like this? And obviously there's so much there about barrel aging and lacto and pedio and all the microbiology that's going on with those kinds of beers. Tons of history in Belgian beer. That was a pivotal moment for me in my beer drinking career, I think. So let's talk about your personal cellars that you may have when you're not, of course, drinking enlightened beers. Uh, do you have any whales down there that you like that you have been cellaring? Do you and have a cellar? Not no, anymore. I don't have a cellar. My cellar's here now. This is my <laughs> cellar. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we've got a we've got a collection here we've been working on getting through. We've got a few things here. I yeah, put we most get of some, the, somebody takes a trip to Chicago or something yeah, like that. Most of the special beer I've got is here because that's where I do most of my drinking and most of my free time and most of my work time. So uh, I did have a cellar for a little while with a lot of Belgian beer and some sour stuff, some big stouts. I really whittled it down partly because it takes up a lot of space. I mean, I've seen guys with just racks and racks and racks of beer in their basements. Yeah. <laughs> am, I, am I looking at I we've got a couple one of those? in front yeah. of us here, Tommy. <laughs> and it's great, but I was like a little overwhelmed by having all that beer. There are some beers that are great to cellar, but beer in general is meant to enjoy. And so I really just started sharing it with a lot of friends. And before I knew it, my cellar was gone. And I actually, I do have a few in the cellar right now, but just those are like beers that I pick up. Like I got a Deep Woods Cafe Death from Revolution. I need to find the right time and place to drink that, so it's kind of stashed in the basement. And, you know, a couple of sour beers. We have an ongoing debate amongst ourselves as well as other brewers that we interview about cellaring and making beers that are there to age. Uh, we've had some brewers that say, absolutely, let's have a symbol on our labels that say this beer is to be cellared and aged for a while. Others say, no, nope, you must drink all our beers as soon as we release it, because when we release it, it is ready. Where do you guys fall on this line? I fall under the, the the school that says, you know, beer is made to be drank. You know, the the freshest possible beer is great beer. But you know what? It's just beer. You know, at, at the end of the day, if you enjoy your beer six months old or you find that you get something different out of it, if you age a, a sour for a year and a half or something like that, then that's specific to your consumption and that's definitely something that you should keep doing because at the end of the day, beer is to make the individual happy uh, as well as enjoy with people. So as, as long as you're not just sitting in your basement it, you, like Schmeagle on your on your gold pile or whatever, being like, <laughs> Squirreling away. I have all the you know, dark lords and assassins. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and my biggest concern is that you know, if if you enjoy cellaring your beer, but you drink it, great. If you enjoy drinking it fresh, great. But if it never passes your lips because you're trading for something better, that's something that, within reason, of course, uh, <laughs> it's something that. You know, I, I say, just try it. Drink That's, it. If that, you've had it, trade it. Fine. But make sure that you're not, you know, yeah, taste you're not it, thinking you know? too hard. It's, it's beer. I think that's Good the nice it. thing about beer is, like, there's a lot of variety in how you can own beer. There are beers that you can keep for a long time and they can sell her. And there are beers that you can get super fresh from the brewery, pull them out of the tank, and drink them fresh. I'd say it. I've gone from being a cellar guy to being more of a fresh beer guy, and that's kind of where I land now. Tell everybody uh, what you have coming up for the rest of the year. I know you have a big collaboration that's coming out uh, very soon, and then do you have any others lined up for the rest of the year? A lot of events going on through summer. This week is starting Milwaukee Beer Week. Milwaukee Craft Beer Week. So a lot yeah, you got to be careful now because I know Milwaukee there craft was Milwaukee Beer Week. week. <laughs> this is actually Milwaukee Craft Beer Week, right. which oh, we craft struggled craft with. Brewery Week. week. You know, I've also yeah, struggled a lot of, with yeah. the nomenclature. We're gonna we're gonna make no cards. We're gonna go over it. We're gonna study it. It'll be fine. Yeah, Brewery um, Week. 
So a bunch of Milwaukee breweries getting together and hosting each other and doing collaboration beers and uh, having events together. So we're really looking forward to that. Tomorrow we're releasing our collaboration with Lakefront Brewery, and they were really awesome to work with. They've been around for a long time, 30, 31 years in Milwaukee. They've taken a thing, you know, from home brewing to what they have now, which is like pretty incredible. So we got a lot of respect for them and it was fun to work with them. We made a nice pale ale with a couple of different hops. So one was basically the the difference was in the dry hopping. We used Denali hops, which was a newer one for me that I haven't heard of from Hopsteiner. Has some nice herbal notes, but also piney, citrusy. It's a fun hop. The other one is some numbers that I don't... <laughs> 06972, I think, yeah, are the numbers. Yeah, I think that was don't, the one. I mean, go and look that up. You probably won't get anywhere, Another but... experimental it's hop. It's some experimental hop that they had that sounded good. I mean, we at one point, we did have the numbers right, and we looked it up, and there were some interesting, you know, tasting notes on that particular hop, which were, you know, vanilla and uh, grape. Grape, and, yeah. Uh, it just... The whole thing sounded really, really cool, and so the, the concept was that we would brew two batches and we would make the same base beer and then we would dry hop each other's, you know, kind of like a, here you go. So, you know, they kind of picked whichever one they wanted to take after everything was all said and done and we picked whichever one we wanted to take and thankfully we agreed that we liked the one we got better and they liked the one they got better. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was fun. So are you guys participating in either the Wisconsin IPA Fest and Challenge or the Project Terroir? And participating in consuming some beer at the Wisconsin <laughs> IPA Fest. <laughs> we, it's uh, going to be really fun. We kind of uh, missed the boat on production. Yeah, um, unfortunately, our production schedule is really tight right now around the summer and all things considered if we made a, an ipa regularly we would have definitely thrown our name in the hat and, and tossed ourselves in there it's going to be really um, fun there's but, be a lot know, of un- beer there. unfortunately for project terroir and, and matt at d14 who, who is a good friend and we're we're really yeah, that's disappointed a great idea it. and like a really uh, it's a cool it's a fantastic cool idea fest. Yeah. we just didn't but have enough time with the collaboration to to turn it around uh, it's hard enough, to so. manage the tank space that we have and um, keep up with all the rest of the stuff that we need to be yeah. doing. For like whatever. making money. <laughs> oh, no, we don't need to do that. We would like to do that one day in 150 years from now. <laughs> yeah, if we really wanted to make money, I don't know if we would have got into beer. Yeah, I think I'd, st- I'd still be in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you guys are really busy. You have the first one that you had bottled, which was the... What was the name From of the it? Roots. From, the, From roots. the Roots. What are your future plans for bottling, canning, distribution in general? I would say partly it is a function of tank space and just trying to keep up with taproom beer. The bottling is going to depend on uh, how much beer we have kind of on hand. If we do have some extra, we'd like to get a few of our year-round beers in bottles and maybe some 12-ounce long necks with put them in six-packs and get them out a little bit, but at least sell them through the brewery. Maybe do a little wholesaling to a few of the liquor stores that we like around here. But you're still looking at self-distributing. Definitely self-distributing. So that's pretty important to you guys. Yeah, I think it's important to us to keep control of where the beer is going and how it's taken care of. And it's nice to have the face-to-face interaction with people that are buying our beer but then are, are going to turn around and sell it. And they have to be able to tell our story, I guess. I don't know. It's just nice to keep it in the neighborhood, know the people that we're selling our beer to that, you know, are going to turn around and put it on tap next to some awesome beer from like all around the world. There is a definite point of there. There's a point where you can get to where, you know, we wouldn't be able to do it ourselves. I mean, the 93 Dodge isn't going to run forever. Yeah. You know, for as long as that thing turns on and for as long as our backs hold up, I think self-distro all the way. Yes. Yeah, the size that we are, it's easy to well, I say easy. It's not always easy, but it's easy enough to do it ourselves and keep it in house. But I think you do reach a point where paperwork becomes too much. Yeah, the time becomes too much. Right. We haven't gotten there yet. At least yeah. I don't think we've gotten there. That's all, Tommy. Anyway, so right. So here at Enlightened, you're all about neighborhood and community and progress and people being comfortable in your space. You guys have recently been in the news lately um, about a sign you have and uh, what happened when a customer ripped it down on you. Could you expand on that a little bit for us here at the Tap Day Girlfriend Podcast? So um, the sign is hate has no home here. Yeah. That's what it says on it. And it's just hanging on a sort of an electrical box, I guess. It's like an alarm box. Yeah, it's kind of a, a dual, dual purpose. Like, hey, this is a cool message. And also, 
don't mind this electrical box that runs the sump pump. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely some it's definitely a message that I think Tommy and I both believe in. You know, we want to make sure that you know everybody feels comfortable coming in and hanging out, and and that everybody's you know not necessarily represented. You know, we're not saying you know we we're, we're, this is not a mission that we are a mouthpiece for. We're not starting a movement. We're not doing anything like that. But you know, we want to give a space to people that possibly are doing that to feel comfortable and enjoy themselves. Yeah, it's uh, not that we put it up because we think that hate is a problem in businesses around. Like, we haven't experienced hateful people coming in here and doing hateful things. We didn't put it up as a response to that. It's like a like any other sign. It's a signal for something that is important to us. I guess it matters that we have a space that's inclusive and where people can come here and have a respectful dialogue. Like, I know there's beer involved, and if you drink beer to excess, you're more prone to arguments or whatever, but it's just a general statement about the type of space that we want to have. And we had a a gentleman in here that maybe didn't agree with that or was offended by the sign and Took on bridge. Yeah, but it was in such an interesting way. I mean, it was very quiet, and then burst of anger, and then quiet you know he wasn't you know he didn't seem to be beyond intoxicated it wasn't anything like you know we got to keep an eye on this guy it was you know just another average person that was in the space so you know rip the sign down and we posted about it just to reiterate why we have it up and what kind of space we want and it really it got a lot of response a lot more than um, we thought it was yeah a lot more than we ever thought uh, so people shared it around and there's some news about it, but it's just interesting. I mean, we never put it up to like feed into this narrative of a divided country. And I know there's a lot of news coverage about the political climate right now. And, you know, we're not trying to weigh in on that. We, it's more of a, just a general statement that we want people to be nice to each other. <laughs> yeah. Try to be Listen civil. to your mom, be nice to people. Yeah. It's, it's really just putting a, a welcome mat on the front door you know yeah. you're saying that you know you're welcome to come in here but just don't trash my place don't yeah. be don't be a dick don't right. be disrespectful no I, I think it was fine I don't think you guys made any big statement it was just some guy who thought a certain way you know yeah when we read it we were just like that's that's pretty interesting <laughs> it was all very surprising to us the, yeah. the entire everything about it was surprising yeah, yeah. The whole, the, even when, yeah so. but hopefully something positive will come out of it no I, I hope so I hope so well, I think uh, I'm looking around the table where we're very low on beer. So I just want to thank you guys for taking some time to chat. Do you want to give the listeners a 411 on this place as far as hours and, or anything else like that? Sure, yeah. Um, so our tap room is open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're closed Monday and Tuesday. So Wednesday, 4 to 10, Thursday, 4 to 11, Friday, Saturday, 3 to midnight, and then Sunday, noon to 5. Try to keep eight beers on tap four year rounds and then four that kind of rotate james and i are behind the, the bar a lot pouring beers and it's really nice to have that interaction with people so come so say come, hi come check out what we do i mean it's all here on display excellent so for myself jesus this is jim andy i'm james and i'm tommy this has been another solid non-fail podcast cheers guys cheers cheers, cheers.